<coughs> Salam. Ooh. Yara, this is gonna happen all the time. Let's just get into it now. Salam alaikum, it's me in a problem. And finally, the cat's out of the bag, okay? The cat is out of the bag. The cat is out. I'm on a TV show. Ah! The first episode of Beulah Queen's Funny Carp was released on Showmax. Finally, after nearly a year of waiting, we finally get to watch this damn show. And I finally get to legally speak about it because Lord knows I broke that India a few times. Before I even start this video, I want to say just how incredibly proud I am of every single person that was a part of this production. It took a fucking village to create this, guys. Like, I can't even begin to describe it. We really created magic and I'm so happy that you guys get to finally see this along with us. We did have our own launch party at the Media 24 building, but I'm not going to reveal too much about that. But this is a monumental thing, not just for queer people, but for colored people as well. And I know that there's feelings around casting. Maybe your favorite queen wasn't casted. That's totally valid, but we all fairly casted for the show. And I think they could not have chosen a better group. This right now, what's happening now with this show is history, live in concert. You are part of queer history forever. It's you as well, the people viewing this, because we need you just as much as anything else to get the show off the fucking ground you know what i mean this was a while ago and we as cast members well most of us um are getting to see this for the first time with you the audience so so we know just as much as you do so this is an exciting journey just for us as well as viewers especially because i'm a huge fan of drag especially cape town drag so as a viewer i'm just as excited as you are as a cast member i'm scared as fuck because i don't remember a damn thing i said Someone told me that obviously everything is scripted and no, not at all. <laughs> There's certain things that are, I won't say scripted, but organized, but the content is a hundred percent real. Those feelings that some of us had and still have are hundred percent real. I promise. I promise. This, you can't make the shit up. So with that said, let's get into what the hell it is that I'm doing here in the first place. I've always wanted to get back onto YouTube and take social media a little bit more seriously, but you know me. <laughs> what this is, it's not a review. I'm not here to review the show. I'm also here to recap the show and just share you a little bit of nuggets and stuff here. This is a neutral space, okay? This is purely for people who watch the show from one viewer to another. Plus, I plan on releasing an episode every single Wednesday, which is the day before new episodes are released so that you have something to watch in preparation for the next episode. How about that? What we're gonna do this is I will be recreating or revisiting some of the makeup looks that I've done on the show or that specific episode. And we're just gonna sit here and kiki and talk. I'm going to recap the episode, but I'm also going to recap the characters because I think that's the focal point of the show, not necessarily the story, but more so the characters and their development along the way. So this is not going to be a makeup tutorial format. However, I will be posting the makeup tutorial on my TikTok. So go ahead and check out my TikTok or subscribe or follow whatever you fucking do there on TikTok and watch my makeup tutorial if that is something that you would like. You know? Obviously chosen to recreate the opening title sequence look or the main promo look which was inspired by a joker, a jester obviously. Also just another disclaimer, I will be using she her pronouns for each contestant as just a reference to how this is how we talk to one another when we are together so so without further ado let's get into it and i'll show you how i did this look and let's talk about beulah queen's funny cup episode one i'm just going to refer to the tv show as beulah going forward because beulah queen's funny cup is going to just take too much breath out of me what beulah is it's a reality tv show following the lives of seven of cape town's most infamous and famous drag queens <laughs> we'd really like to first introduce you to the cast members so that we can understand who it is that we are working with and following you on this journey we all know each other it's obvious but um i would like to just speak a little bit about my relationship going into the the show with the girls so that you can know how i what what mindset i was in when we started filming so introducing the cast in alphabetical order so that y'all don't get cute on the internet mm -hmm. and the girls themselves we're gonna start with be valor so Bibi Valor is all the, I'm also just note, if it does look like I'm looking this side a lot, because I'm reading my notes, I made notes yesterday. I'm a professional, you know what I mean? I don't know. But Bibi Valor's main kind of introduction is the fact that she is the mother of the house of Valor. She is known for dancing and also hanging on zero to one's little scaffolding moment that they have. And just like, you know, 
breaking the stage, literally. The scene with Phoebe and her dancers that made me very happy when she introduced her because I'm a dancer myself. You know how dancers, we usually have our own language. We never go one and two and three and four. It's always pa, da, da, pa, 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 you know? She was like, minge, 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 me, kai. I was like, that's do that's gay. That's gay, 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 gay. I think Phoebe might be the gayest on the cast, to be honest. We also learned that she lost her home to a fire. I had no idea that she was going through all of that. So this was a shock to me. And this is just another testament to the fact that, yeah, we shot this show so long ago. But like, we are also learning with you guys about each other's stories and where we come from. You know what I mean? I cannot imagine that type of grief. I'm really proud of Phoebe for pushing through and, and actually competing in the competition. I think it's a sign of just how resilient people from the Cape Flats are. Like... Props to you, baby. Props to you. So a very cute moment where all the girls are like laughing and saying like a brand of and stuff like that. That's also just a testament to our culture in Cape Town amongst queer people. We go through things, you know, but we, we always laugh about it and together because we understand that if we don't laugh, we will literally crumble. Happy that she's found that unit for her to be able to express that. I didn't necessarily hang out with Bibi and when we used to see each other in the clubs and stuff it was a hello and a goodbye because we knew each other and we've also worked together a few times. I actually approached Bibi in the club one night to ask her to be my drag daughter and she nipped me like a Stuyvesant. <laughs> she said to me no she's actually a Mogan's drag mother and I immediately backed off. But this bitch was like handstanding on she just like dropped from that handstand flat into a split and started swinging her legs around into splits and splits. I was gagged. I was proper gagged. Like, that's not shit that you usually see in Cape Town. Like, I can't do that. And I was really impressed with her the first time. Speaking of her drag mother, we're gonna move on to the next one. Imogen Moa. Imogen Moa is all the way from Mitchell Splain. We find out that she's also a netball coach, which is something that I actually did know about. She brought up a really good point about, like, the t kinds of things we grew up as, like, colored kids and little gay boys. That we're not necessarily always allowed to compete in, like, girly kind of sports like netball is considered like a girl's sport i know it's progressed a little bit more and people are doing these boys who play netball now but back then it really wasn't that like open imogen is an established queen in the pageant circuit and she also won miss k western cape or miss sovereign western cape why do i call it because we're gonna have a little conflict every time miss k western cape and miss sovereign western cape is the same pageant we we'll always refer to it as miss k western cape because that's what she won that's what it was called when she won so Imogen won Miss Gay Wisdom Cape in 2017, which is actually the year I competed as well. <laughs> this is a photo of the two of us. She's going to hate me for posting this photo, but that's the Mary Imogen. <laughs> Imogen's one of those performers that I feel like you can't necessarily not enjoy. Like, she, she's openly spoken about this in the show, that she, she didn't feel as flawless before Maxine came around. Like, even though she wasn't necessarily the most polished queen, she still had such a char charisma and energy that you just couldn't help but, like, fall in love with. And I think to this day, that is still in her style of performance. So out of everyone, Imogen probably had the strongest character introduction for me because she really delves into various facets of her life that I don't think everyone else kind of like dipped their toes into immediately. When we get introduced to Imogen, we also meet her mother and some of her family members. And Imogen expresses that she would really like to kind of invite her father to one of her drag shows. And she also says that her dad does not know she do drag. But we meet Imogen's mother and she is the sweetest little lady in the world. She reassures Imogen about the fact that her dad has never been a negative type of person. So she doesn't feel that her dad would respond in a negative way about her, her doing drag. So has like a very sweet moment where she says that, you know, it's not necessarily always about what people's going to say. And if people do say things that she as her mother is there to support her and have her back if that does happen, which I think is the sweetest thing. A mother's support is something that we all want, and I'm very happy that Imogen has that. Again, I'm learning things with you guys about her. <laughs> Imogen also shares a little bit about her not knowing about her parents' separation, and she feels that her parents withheld some pieces of information from her, because um, obviously, like, I mean, family dynamics is always a weird thing, so I understand where she's coming from. I think Imogen really brings, like, a perspective of community. She speaks about how even her netball kids' parents come and watch her shows and stuff. I think that's really cool, and I am really into Imogen's story almost immediately. I really want to find out more. 
one thing I can say about Imogen is she's very competitive. <laughs> yes, I would come in like literally a jersey and a panty to rehearsals and she would always like be like, but I should take the blah, 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 blah. Imogen plays mind games. <laughs> Imogen probably out of all the cast members is one of the people I'm really, really proud of because of where we come from. We just playing is a hub for talent. It's not always that we get platforms to kind of like perform our talents and to exist. So for her and me to both be on a show like this, that's monumental, not just for queer people, but for colored people as well. It, I'm so proud of her and I've said it to her so many times before. She's probably sick of me saying it to her, but I truly am proud of you, Morgan. And yeah, as a viewer, I'm very excited to, to learn your story and see where you come from and learn something new about you. Yeah, so hey, Morgan, thank you. Vu. So technically, I'm the next person that we're going to have to speak about, but I am going to skip myself and save myself a loss because... And I'm going to be speaking about the one that only Kat Jelati. Kat is a woman that needs absolutely no introduction. Like, I mean, come on. Kat has been doing drag for as long as the Titanic has been laying on the sea floor. You know what I mean? Kat is well known for being part of the girl group 3D who have performed across the country, Macy. Like, old school drag, honey. The members of this group include Angel Alamo and Jada Kay. Like, we can't forget to mention them as well. Kat by far is one of the most experienced queens, you know? And one of the hard, most hardworking queens as well, if I say so. Kat is also a former Miss Gay Western Cape and she clinched the title in 2010. And if you really, really, really are interested in the law behind everyone, please go and watch Glitter Boys and Ganglands. It follows the lives of three contestants in that pageant and Kat is one of them. So please go and watch Glitter Boys and Ganglands. It's vital that every queer person in Cape Town watches Glitter Boys and Ganglands. So I've linked it in the description below. Educate yourself, you need. Know? If you really do want to follow more, you can also watch Counterculture, which also follows Catchalari and 3D, as well as Adrian, who has since passed away. But please go and watch these documentaries. It's vital pieces of our history, and everyone should be watching this. Okay, done. So in short, Cat's been around. You need. Know? She's a certified legend. Let's say that. When we meet Cat, she's at the fabric store, which is always like a thing for her because even in Cat was in Ganglands, the bitches at the fabric store. And we also get introduced to Kat's husband, Errol, who is the sweetest person I fucking know, honestly. We find out that she and Errol has kind of been together for 20 years. <sighs> Errol is just as so much a part of Kat as Kat is to Errol. You know what I mean? They are literally partners, life partners. I've not seen any type of example of, of love and relationship and marriage between gay people like I have between the two of them. And it's just such a precious thing to experience and I'm happy that they both are doing this together. Errol is also the owner of Niku Underwear, which I just need to give Errol props because in the Glitter Boys and Ganglands documentary, Errol speaks about wanting his own underwear company and he's got it. Put some respect on this Niku. Mm -hmm. What I also really enjoyed is just watching Manila in Diaries get emotional a little bit about Kat because the two of them have a very special relationship. They've obviously known each other for the longest period out of all the cast members, but Kat and Manila truly have a sisterhood that like is it's just beautiful and I'm happy that that's going to be on TV. <laughs> My relationship with Kat have kind of like developed over the years because we are like on two separate sides of the coin if you know what I mean like in terms of our drag like we don't necessarily approach our drag in the same way so they I won't say that there was misunderstanding but she did disclose to me that she didn't get me at first and I think we had a turning point together when we were in Eisner. I, we spent time together, we drank together, we laughed together, we joked together, we shared together. And there was just a moment where the two of us were just like, we get it. You know, I get you and you get me. And I actually physically got down on my knees and bowed to her. I told her like, you've got all my respect in the world. Like, I'm very grateful that I get to do the show with Kat. And also, I, uh, I think our relationship grows a little bit more, as you will see likes to always say that my whole drag aesthetic is very tops and net <laughs> but i love her so much i was just happy to go into this and further develop my relationship with her during the show and what i'm excited about for kat is like she she truly is in a different time of her career and i'm so glad that this opportunity has come for her to kind of like show just even how much she has grown from glitter boys and ganglands to now it's completely different people and i am all for her getting her her tens like she's a legend she's she's catch a lardy you know the next person we have is madison scar the villain of the season villain before we even introduce madison can i just say sis 
Just off of the cards is kicking your ass, baby. Ass. Addison is a renowned performer here in Cape Town, and she is most well known for her amazing Beyonce shows that she has at Zero. Have you been to the Cowboy Carter one? Have you been to the Renaissance one? No? Well, then you fucking missed out, okay? Ugh, I shouldn't be casting out. Madison is also a dancer and choreographer known for making waves on shows like Espresso and also across the city with her Scarlets, you know what I mean? When we meet Madison, she is speaking openly about... Uh, yeah, what the fuck was that? That's very athlone. I think Madison jumped into me there for a second. When we meet Madison, we meet her with the Blogging, who is also another drag performer here in Cape Town and also a good friend of mine. And they speak openly about Madison's um, transition journey, which at the time was only seven months, which again, I did not know. Like, I thought the girls had been, you know, cunty, fishy, cunty, pop for years. Cunty! Well, it's seven months. That's how old Madison is. I'm so here for this trans representation on this TV show. Like, it's about damn time, you know? And I'm so eager to learn other perspectives of trans experience because I truly feel like it's a very unique and special experience to be a trans person and i'm happy that we get to to experience that through her from the get-go i think walking into the show madison was probably the person i knew the least about because we did not necessarily work together or anything we just kind of like know each other again from the clubs all i remember is one day that madison actually came up to me in the club and at the bar at zero to one and she was just like oh i uh, you are the doja cat girl um have you seen my doja cat Hmm, watch out like very that so i immediately knew that this bitch is competitive as hell and that was kind of like my first engagement with madison I didn't necessarily take her too hard or like you know hate her for it because her talent speak for itself she gives you a production and she's not afraid to say that <laughs> i'm really happy for people to to see just how passionate she is about what it is that she do and i'm also happy for her to be the villain <laughs> I think we really learned a lot about Madison necessarily personally in this episode aside from her um, excitement with her transition journey and things like that but I, I truly know just based on the trailer for the next episode which I'm not gonna spoil too much but I have a feeling we will learn a little bit more about Madison's family and Madison's where she comes from because in essence I think at this point in the show in episode one you know as the audience just as much as we do about Madison you know what I mean yeah I'm really excited to learn about Madison's story I've I'm, I'm just excited to learn about everyone's story, to be honest. But yeah, let's continue. So the next screen we're going to tackle is the one and only Manila Von Teese. I mean, do we really need to say much here? If this was Dance Moms now, Manila would be Mary Ziegler. And Barry would be... <laughs> I can't say that! I can't say that. I can't say that. I take that back. Sorry, let's start over. Manila is probably most known for her placement on Is This Got Talent, where she placed second. A drag act has never even gone that far, you know, let alone almost win the damn gig. One of the best drag queens in the city. I'm not blowing gas up her ass whatsoever. These are just the facts. When we see Manila, she is talking to Barry, who is her manager slash business partner slash 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 slash. Barry Reed is also one of the co-directors for the Miss Sovereign pageant and is a legend in his own right. Not just for his contribution to Manila's career and the partnership that they've built over the years, but also just for the work he's done for the community of drag in Cape Town. Like, Barry, there would not be a lot of the things that we have today if it had not been for Barry. Just put some respect on Barry Reed, please. Barry Loki is the eighth cast member, if you ask me. We found out that their working relationship actually started as something more romantic. <laughs> it's nice to uh, to see other people get shocked by that news. Like, why is it so difficult to believe that Barry and Manila used to fuck? <laughs> Honestly, if you actually know the two of them very well, they actually, you could tell that they... Uh, they're pretty much still in a relationship with one another, to be honest. <laughs> they understand each other very well and it's always lovely to watch just how they they work together because the jobs get done, you know? The the work is done. And they are they make a very fucking good team, even if I say so myself. Manila also introduces us to Roberto, who is the owner of the club Zero to One. I'm certain we'll get to see Roberto somewhere more along the lines. There's nothing really of substance in that conversation. But I think it's more so to introduce not just Roberto, but also the space of Zero to One. Because Roberto's always been wanting to give his space to anyone who needs a platform. And I think that's exactly what this introduction is. Roberto, season two, let's have a conversation, please. Time. 
I honestly can not tell you anything about Manila that you have not heard or know already. Like, I can't give you any information on her, her background or... Uh, there's no way I can introduce Manila. She, you know who the fuck she is. She said it herself. Girl, you know what? Mm. Being the girl, she is the girl, she'll always be the girl. Period. Two of us kind of developed like a really good friendship over the past like three years. What I'm really excited about for Manila is to just, to, to, you know, she's the consummate professional. She's the one that's always together and the looks are together. And she kind of can be intimidating, which I understand. But what I don't feel like people know is that Manila is cock stupid. Like, <laughs> she's such a jokester and she's so funny. I'm happy that this platform is kind of going to get you to see just how fucking annoying and funny Manila is. I'm really excited for people to see her. I truly feel like who she portrays herself to be on this TV show is 100% like I know her. And I've also had the, the blessing, dare I say, to become friends with Vion. And yeah, I just love Manila. I think there's nothing further I can say there. Next up, we have the one the only Maxine Wilde. Maxine is a well-known queen in the city all the way from Belhar. Is it Belleville or Belhar? It's the North. You know what I mean? So she's fucked up. <laughs> she's an amazing makeup artist and hairstylist and she's immediately introduced in the show as one of the co-owners of the Drag Hotel. The Drag Hotel is basically just a talent agency for drag acts specifically, but also a bunch of other queer artists, whether it's emceeing, um, singers and things like that. It's just a gay old time, you know what I mean? We are also introduced to Maxine's partner and business partner, Nazim Southgate. A Manila bad vibe. <laughs> Maxine was also crowned Miss Gay Western Cape in 2018 and is actually the longest reigning due to the COVID-19 um, restrictions. On the she's also no stranger to the pageant world. Like, girl, she snatched a few titles, you know what I mean? And also say what you want about this bitch. One thing you can't take away from Maxine is this bitch is beautiful. Beautiful. My relationship with Maxine going to the show was a little bit more complicated and a little bit more complex because I think out of everyone, I know Maxine personally the longest. We didn't necessarily have any beef or any um, fights going on, but we weren't necessarily hanging out every weekend with one another, if that makes sense. So we also just know how to keep it cordial with one another because we've had years and years of working with one another. And I think mostly in the working with one another part of it all is where the two of us used to like clash so to speak the two of us have shared many personal stories with one another we have lived together for like a month we worked together maxine actually got me the job at urban decay we even tried starting a girl group together which was called the what the fuck was it called not me forgetting the girl group. shady we actually did have a girl group together it was called the uh what the fuck Iconic. It was called Iconic, okay? With myself, Maxine, and Kalani. I do feel like um, we have a different type of bond than I have with the rest of the cast. Like, we, we know each other differently, so to speak. I truly am happy to see Maxine on this cast because Maxine has always spoken for years just about how hard she works and how she doesn't necessarily feel like she gets the, the, the credit she deserves. And I feel like with this TV show and with the drag cartel, you can see that she's no longer just gonna sit and wait for these opportunities. She's out here to grab it. She's always been a girl getter. It's beautiful to watch Maxine because she's one of those queens that I feel like is very serious about her goals and her dreams and she will do anything, anything to achieve them. I know her being a part of this cast was also a big step in that direction. So I'm truly am ecstatic and happy for Maxine to be a part of this cast. I'm really keen to see more personal moments from her because in the introduction, it just seemed business related, but she did mention about her drag family because I think Maxine has the biggest drag family in the whole of Cape Town. She, Maxine, she knows she don't need no epidural. Let's say that. I'm sure Maxine's gonna gag you with the looks because that bitch can paint and you know she's going to be stoned from head to toe. So, props to you Maxine, let's see where it goes. And finally, with no... What was, where was I going with that? Bitch, it's me. I'm the next character. Me, inappropriate. Me, in the flesh, live. Hello, me, hi. <laughs> I'm not really sure how to go about like commenting on myself because I'm not someone who kind of like does that a lot to speak from my own perspective but I'm looking at myself from the outside now it's do you know what I mean it's very complicated to watch yourself on tv and see how you act a fool I'm gonna try my best to give you as unbiased of an opinion on myself as I can the best way for me to preface everything is to say 
I am so Lulu's. <laughs> this episode, I didn't get much airtime. Let's just be honest. But it wasn't even the airtime that mattered. It was more so the content. And I do think that I made my impact and my personality shine regardless of how long I was on your screen. Let me just do this, bro, because I'm going to stress if I get this cue. The scenes where I'm on were just so funny to me because I I never... People always say that I'm like funny and I'm like stupid and I'm cuckoo and all of that stuff. I'm aware that I'm funny, but like to see it live is like a different experience. But at that time, I fully quit my job to um, commit myself to drag and to also film the show. So it was a, a very different time for me. <laughs> I also had been seeing a therapist for about a year, which is something that I actually speak to my mom about in the show. And it's crazy to watch myself, not just because it's cringe, but because but because it's really cool to look back at the person that I was back then and see how much I've grown. So I'm very proud of myself for, for that. It's so surreal to me that I'm on a fucking TV show, on a reality TV show, and like that I'm just being gay, you know? That's what got me here in the first place, something that I ran away for for so long, and now it's something I'm being celebrated for. So it's a very out-of-body experience to go through this and i'm sure the other cast members feel the same in terms of content for me we do touch on the fact that i have a very supportive mother and when i say she's like a universal remote she truly fucking is like she will meet new gays and add them on facebook and comment on their stuff and like everyone knows my mom like everyone loves my mom and i always allow her to have that relationship with people because the two of us did not necessarily have that from the get-go you know what i mean we worked very hard and we went through a lot together to be able to be the way that we are today. When they said that for the first day of filming what it is that we want to do, I knew from the beginning that I would like to start this journey with my mother. The two of us have been through so much together as a family, but more so together, the two of us, like we, uh, I don't want to spoil too much, but I will have this conversation probably after the TV show where I can elaborate on a little bit more details. I think the fact that she called me a tough cookie and said that I must just go out there and do that is a testament to the relationship that I have with my mother. She truly is my biggest support. And I know we don't often like spend a lot of time together just because financially we can't always, but my mother knows exactly what I've been through. Exactly from beginning to end. She knows exactly where I come from, why I am the way I am. And instead of, oh, it's okay, you're my baby. She's very like, no, this is not okay. Or you need to do, you know what I mean? That's the kind of relationship we, we truly are friends. I know you shouldn't say that about your parents, but she is my best friend. Even though I just want to ring her neck sometimes, you know what I mean? So I'm very glad that I have this moment with my mom in the TV show where we're talking about my mental health journey because at that point, this was the first time we saw each other in months as well. So <laughs> it was also, uh, it was also that element to it. We were genuinely happy to see each other and we actually did have conversation, serious conversation in that, in that episode. And I'm just glad that it's documented because that's going to be a very good piece for me for the rest of my life, you know? Uh, I'm not going to get emotional. No. Anyway, I described my drag as a little bit crafty, fashionable, edgy, organized chaos. To be honest, I don't remember saying any of those words. <laughs> but I can't argue that it's quite accurately describing my drag aesthetic. Also touch a little bit on my family and our history, which I'm sure will be elaborated on as the show progresses. So I'm not going to touch too much on that. But yes, my dad was a drug addict and we lost everything as a result of all of that. I think let it organically develop. I think the story will develop as the show progresses and you will learn a lot more about me and where I come from. I'm happy that I have the shortest descriptor. I think I left a little bit of a taste in people's mouths and now they're like, oh, who's this? And I'm glad to see a lot of the people online are also gravitating towards me as a character because I didn't expect them to with the short amount of time I got on screen. So I'm really grateful that people are, are connecting with me and are eager to see where I come from and what it is that I do, well, all, 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 all of that. <laughs> I'm keen to see where the storyline goes and just how they tell my story because I can already feel the mental health approach with me as a character and I'm fine with that. I'm totally fine with that. It is a community I represent proudly and I would speak any day and any time about mental health and the importance thereof. Now you've been introduced to the cast and as we go by week by week, I will just give a little updates on everyone's storylines and then we can go on to the part where I speak about the actual story in the show because i think that's the best way for me to structure it you know what i mean 
So before we continue with the story of the show, let's discuss a few little things that also need to be just addressed so that you can understand the context of a lot of what goes on throughout the show. So there's two situations that's going to come up quite often in the show that I think I just need to just like touch on so that you're also aware. For those of you who are just watching this recaps and not paying for subscription at Showmax, this is for you. Number one is the old host saga. Okay. March 2023, I want to say last year, March, um, a bunch of us went through to the Peacock Festival in Eisner, which was stunning. Everyone except Madison was actually on the strip with us. So while we were on the strip, you know, Madison and Jada K, we've also met in the show that's also part of 3D. The two of them had like a social media tough on uh, M's post or something. I don't know what the fuck happened, if I'm going to be honest. Apparently, this is when Madison called out those of you who are in Eisner, or the old hoes, and us in Neisner, we were all taken aback, like, what the fuck did we do to you? Like, where does this come from? And we didn't know if it was for someone specifically, or whatever the case may be, but that does get elaborated on the show, so I'm not going to spoil too much. Madison was putting people on blast, and we don't know why, and <laughs> that is basically what the old hoes situation is about. Then we also have the Wigate situation, which, my god, if I have to hear one more time, this is a case in which People's belongings were stolen at zero to one from the backstage area. This was inclusive of Madison's wigs. So Madison actually accused one of BB's drag daughters for stealing the wig. And um, there was a back and forth and there were threats of physical violence. Girl was messy, but Madison didn't let this go. She was adamant that this bitch stole her wigs and she needs to give my stuff back. And this is, that's basically what Wiggate is about. Anyway, that's just the backstory, a little bit of where they come from. So here we go, I'm gonna do my finishing touches for my makeup and we're gonna just recap what happened throughout the show in terms of the story, you know what I mean? The, the entire story. Let's do it. So the show opens up with a little bit of like the trailer teasers and some of the footage from the trailers and it goes straight into the opening title sequence which I cannot give enough props to and for, you know what I mean? We actually filmed the opening title sequence at St. George's Cathedral and then we also filmed the second part of it at some field in Lansdowne. I'm not actually sure where. Well done to Quibus and the whole crew for what the hell they put together. It's a brilliant opening title sequence and... Mwah, 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 mwah. They open up with Melinda and Barry who are discussing their calendar together. And they're saying that there's a few things that they need to go through. And we basically establish um, Manila's character as a whole. Also get to see some of the relationships highlighted, especially the working one between Roberto and Manila, because Manila has been with Roberto from the beginning. Chiapini Street Girl. Next, we are introduced to Kat and Errol, and they are at the fabric store before Manila um, phones Kat and asks her to make a turn so that they can discuss what they're going to do for Kat's birthday party. We have a little cute exchange between the two of them before we head to rehearsal with Kat, where you are introduced to Jada K. Johnson for the first time. Jada and Kat, if you remember, are a part of 3D along with Angel. Lalamore. We move on to Maxine's introduction and Maxine and Azim are walking on Hope Bay Beach with their little dogs. Two of them are basically discussing the different dynamics between Maxine's drag house and the drag hotel and Maxine states clearly that the drag hotel is work and the drag family is family and the girl shouldn't feel some type of way of her attention is more on one place than the other. 100% sure this will be elaborated on and highlighted a little bit more as the drag hotel is a big part of Maxine's story and also her life at the moment. Maxine invites Jada K as well as Imogen and BB over to her studio and, and we've, we get a little bit of a discussion regarding what the girls would like from the drag hotel as they have joined and Imogen states that she would like to do a little bit more castings and do some more set work and those are things that Maxine says that she can do. Maxine states in the episode that the time of waiting for opportunities to come to you are over and it's now time to go ahead and just, you know, take what you want from the world. And this is very much highlighting Maxine's go-getter attitude. We also see some type of dynamic at play with the way in which they engage with one another, especially Maxine and Morgan. And we start to see the chemistry that they share, um, even while Bibi shares some of the harshest traumas in her life. This is a depiction, a true depiction of how a, a gathering goes between the girls, probably. Then back at Manila's place where Kat and myself arrive and we have a little luncheon. Oh my God, I can't remember what Manila made, but it was so good. So we are discussing what we are going to do for Kat's birthday and Kat suggests that she would like to have like a braai for the girls, you know? Just Manila, because she's that girl, <laughs> suggests that we do it themed. And what do you know? 
a cowboy theme it is. So then Manila goes ahead and sends invitations to everyone and we cut over back to Maxine's place where Imogen receives the invitation first. The girls immediately start talking about whether or not they think that Madison was invited and we can clearly see that overall not any of us have kind of a connection or a real relationship with Madison and we really are curious to see um, if she comes and what that's going to be like. We segue into Madison's character introduction and we have a little cute scene with um, Dee blogging and Madison at Mingles which is zero to one second venue. And also they are hosting viewing parties every Thursday at Mingles in Woodstock. So stick it, I might come to a few, you know? Madison and Dee are discussing Madison's trans journey and Dee is a good confidant for Madison as Dee has also gone through her transition process and can guide Madison as she's still very new and seven months into this gig. Madison receives the invitation and is taken aback a little bit because she doesn't understand why um, Manila would invite her, like this is the first time she's ever gotten an invitation to hang out outside of a club. Madison is skeptical at first, but she eventually does decide to attend the bride, not to show us who she is, but to show us that we don't know her. <laughs> also, when it's the day of the bride, and Manila and myself, we are getting ready for the bride at Manila's place. Um, and we preface by saying that I will not necessarily be able to stay the entire bride because I do in fact have to go work that night. The guests start arriving and Kat and Errol arrives first. Kat is overwhelmed with joy because she's really surprised that Manila, not actually surprised, I think she is a little bit more appreciative of the fact that Manila would go the extra step to organize such a party for her. So arrive is Bibi and Imogen and fashionably late as always is Maxine Wilde and Jericho. The party begins and everyone starts to sing for Kat and soon after I leave because I have a gig. And Maxine immediately goes in with Madison and asks her like um, why she has this wall up. And would she like to explain that? And Madison proceeds to answer by saying that she always knew who we were from the clubs and stuff. And that's kind of all she wanted to know anyway. So I was like, oh, Madison's throwing the first punch, bitch. We immediately start talking about the old hoes situation and Imogen states that the conversation she had with Madison, Madison stated that the old hoes did not include them. But instead we find out that the old hoes Madison was referencing was actually Jada Kay, Cachelardi, Errol Struble, and Naim. I know she says Razim in the translation, but I'm, I'm certain she meant Naim because I also get their names confused. It was Kat's little entourage and also the people Kat is always with, you know what I mean? This really shocks Kat and blindsides her a little bit because she had no idea that she was involved and visibly Kat is upset. She continues to tell Madison that if Madison does hear anything about what Kat could have possibly said, that she should address it with Kat directly because Kat's not someone that's not going to speak to you about an issue that you may have with her. Madison goes ahead and apologizes to Kat and everything seems fine until Manila brings up Wigate. <laughs> this is when round one between Bibi and Madison starts. Bibi says that she thought she and Madison would get along well because they both are dancers, even though Madison did not go overseas for dancing like she did. <laughs> Shade. Well, that gang. The girls are officially girling. Bibi doesn't hold back with the shade and Madison feels that Bibi is only doing this to misdirect from the fact that she's responsible or her family is responsible for stealing the wigs. Obviously, Madison gets upset and tells Bibi to shut up and all hell breaks loose. <laughs> Bibi and Madison just go at it with one another. I'm not going to spoil too much. Go watch it. It's entertaining. It's fun. Madison then says that she feels like Bibi is being protected by the drag cartel and they don't want to hear anything about her. Beta K and Kat and Manila go inside to just have a little discussion on their own about what's going on and Jada K is also visibly upset because Jada and Madison has had this beef for years at this point. Maxine joins in and discusses the fact that she feels like if Madison doesn't like them she should just say it so that they know where they stand with her but it feels to Kat that this is not the right time it's her birthday and she really wants to celebrate the fact that it's a special moment. Manila them all agrees that this is not the time and they're just going to go ahead and continue with the party and that's exactly what they do. Madison leaves for her gig even though Imogen is quite skeptical about the fact that she might have a gig. But nevertheless, the party continues and the stage is set for the season. Overall, I think this is a great first episode. I think everyone gets their fair share. Everyone is introduced very well. And I think everyone who is watching is now introduced and understands what the situations and what tensions are actually at play within the group dynamic. Characters have been set and we can start to see who kind of fits in which role, who's the drama about, who's the shady one, who's this, who's that, who's the diva, who's the... You know what I mean? We, we understand the characters and we can completely understand the dynamics between the girls.
that concludes the episode this is episode one and this is where we are at with the girls i'm just gonna go ahead and finish my makeup look and i will come back with the final look where we can debrief and we can also talk about some behind the scenes little things you know little tidbits here and there how about that So this is my promo look or my opening title sequence look for the episode and I'm gonna take this headpiece off because she's literally just gonna stab it. Tosh me. Technically I had it glued onto my scalp that day but today I'm not doing all of that okay. This is gonna come off in the next half an hour so period. I'm also gonna just remove this glove. So just before I conclude I thought it would be fun to end off with you know like little tidbits, little inside stories, little surprise things that you may have missed in the show. You know just little, some little... What do you call it? Eggplants. No? It's got to do with eggs. Easter eggs! Eggplants. You really want what you want, eh? <laughs> I'm not sure if anyone noticed this, but every single person in the cast has their own little emblem at the back in diaries. That's correct. Mine is a disco ball because... It's a thousand shattered pieces of glass that make up one beautiful, like, piece of... Ball? You know what I mean. You know where I'm going with it. So I love disco balls. I have a tattoo of a disco ball. Disco Tits is my first song I've ever performed. Disco balls are just important. I just love disco and balls. But closely, you will see BB has an Eiffel Tower in reference to her bonjour because she's from France. Not really from France. I think that's just her branding. Go with it. You know, Abby Morgan Moore also loves balls, but in this case, she has a netball to represent her love for the sport and it's also a big part of who she is. We have Kat Gillardi who has a gown because... So it's out every fabric store. <laughs> I don't know why she has a gown. I guess she's glamour, you know? Sequins, gowns. Because I think Cat might actually own more fucking sequins than everyone else combined. Then we have Madison Scar, who has our shade rack. She's got, I don't have a nice clear picture of it, but it's just a, a bunch of sunglasses. And that's obvious. She's shady. And she's gonna read the dolls. We have Manila Von Tees, who has this little beautiful pin cushion with a bunch of needles and things in to represent the fact that she's a seamstress and she also just likes voodoo. Maxine Wilde has a wig because she's a wig stylist and Maxine really does have the most hair in the entire city. That bitch has boxes and boxes of hair and she also sells them so go support small businesses. Another thing I thought was cute was there was a moment where we see Cat's little passageway in her house and when I tell you it's it's a proper museum. There's articles of Kat's entire career framed up against every single piece of wall in our house. It's beautiful. It's an archive. And I really hope that we see that a little bit more in the show. Because I, I just stand there. And it'll make the best cup of coffee. So you'll make me a cup of coffee and I'll just stand there and just read the articles and stuff. It's beautiful. I love that kind of shit. I'm a very sentimental person myself. So love it. Also, we go to Maxine's studio and there's a few things I'd like to point out here. Firstly, the studio is clean. Okay. <laughs> the girl's really prepared for the show, eh? Because we know that's not how it usually looks. But you can see this poster in Maxine's room, which is actually a gig that I was part of. And it was, I think it was called Coming Out. And this was not last year, the year before in Stellenbosch. I thought it was cute that she still has this poster because I wish I fucking did. Also in the corner at the bottom, you can see there's a little bit of a glimpse of a photo, which is actually a photo shoot myself, Maxine and Kalani did for Club X magazine, of which I do not fucking have the hard copies, Maxine. Alas, this is us and I ate the girls. Ugh. There is another B-roll, which is me skating on the promenade, and you did see that I probably switched wigs throughout, because I had two brown wigs that I originally wanted to wear for it, but I didn't have time to style it, so... The wind just totally ripped it off my scalp, to be honest. And luckily I brought my other human wig and that was exactly what we went with. And what a beautiful morning that was. This thing was the little milkmaid thing I had in my hair at the braai, which I literally made that day at Manila's place with some hot glue and some stones and a cokey because my look clearly wasn't clear enough to anyone. <laughs> yeah, that's, those are my little tidbits, little fun things I think that is the eggs that I would like to have pointed out just so you guys know. And anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you next week, Wednesday. I'm going to try my best to be more on time. And no, I shouldn't actually just try my best. I will be on time next week, Wednesday, so that you can get your weekly recap from me inappropriate. A member of Beulah, Queen Sonica. Ah!
Isn't this insane, guys? Isn't this fucking insane? Please follow me on social media and don't forget to go and like, subscribe, and comment, engage with the content here on YouTube because I'm the only one doing this shit. Also, left everyone else's socials on screen, so go and follow them and keep up with what they are doing. Go support them, go to the gigs, go to their businesses, support their businesses, do all of that shit. We really, this is why we do this show, you know, this is why we did this. I want to beg and plead you guys to please engage with the content, comment, like, share, subscribe, follow. Please engage with us. This is really what we need. This We can't just have a TV show and watch it and that's it. We need you guys to blow this shit up, okay? I would love to see more reviews. I would love to see more recaps. I would love to see people tweeting and using the hashtag, which is official hashtag is Bueller Queens Showmax. That's the official hashtag for the show. Use the hashtag. Blow up this content, like we, we literally, we've done the work, we've shot the show, we're presenting it to you now, this is now your job, you are responsible for making this a phenomenon and to blow it up so that we can fuck get a season 2, I mean that's in, in, in essence what we really want and maybe a tour even, you know, this is totally in your hands now, so please get your subscriptions Go and follow the queens, see what we are doing. I would love to be invited to podcasts and viewing parties and, and I want to see reaction videos. I, engage, please. Celebrate this beautiful moment for our community and show people why queer is where it's at. Being queer is... What is the girls? You need Love you guys so much. Don't forget to go and check out Beulah Queens for the Cup. Only on Showmax, new episodes every single Thursday. Don't miss out. Max Kubi. Ozwach. Bye-bye.